Every time I watch a movie, specifically psychological films, I can't help but immediately try to dissect the deeper meaning and look for any type of messaging that the director might have layered into the plot of the film. And honestly, upon my first viewing of Vivarium, I thought that it was very on the nose, that there wasn't really very much depth, and that the analogy, the main allegory, was pretty clear from the very start of the film, to the final sort of reveal, if there even is a reveal, and also some subtle, light statements about modern society. While I was mostly correct in this assertion, there were actually a few interesting details that may have gone over my head, as well as some very interesting parallels that I'd like to discuss. But in order to discuss these topics, I'd like to briefly summarize the plot of Vibarium and then discuss the deeper underlying implications and symbolism of the film. So let's get into it. One of the very first things I'd like to mention is that this film might have the smallest cast of any film I've ever seen. With a grand total of 14 cast members and two unaccredited characters, this is certainly a more low-budget film. And I'm not counting the children in the classroom at the start of the film, as they're only in the film for a whopping 60 seconds. With Jesse Eisenberg as the main star power of the film, it shouldn't be very surprising to anyone that I went in skeptical and uncertain if this was going to be worth the watch. The film opens up with an absolutely gorgeous shot of a baby bird known as a cuckoo being fed by a much smaller mother warbler bird. The cuckoo kills the other hatchlings in the process. This imagery is both beautiful and highly disturbing, and if you're instantly thinking that this imagery would be symbolic to the plot of the film, you're absolutely right. It's not just symbolic of the plot, it's literally the entire plot of this film. After I finish running through the plot, I'm going to explain this in much greater detail. The film begins with a primary school teacher, Gemma, consoling one of her students, Molly, after coming across the dead warbler chicks. Gemma explains to Molly that this is just nature, this is just the way things are. In the business, we call this foreshadowing. So Gemma and her handyman boyfriend, Tom, decide to go house hunting together and visit a real estate office where they meet Martin, a real estate agent. And within the first five seconds of this dude talking, you're instantly weirded out, like a lot. He's too clean looking and very fake and plasticky and has no social skills and everything he says sounds very rehearsed, which we later learn it is. He totally takes control of the entire situation before Tom or Gemma demonstrate any interest in living in one of these houses. He coerces them into taking a trip to the housing development known as Yonder. At the moment they arrive, there's this very strange liminal feeling of just nothingness, ubiquity. The same houses, the same streets, no structural diversity, even the clouds look exactly the same. You're instantly tipped off as the viewer that this isn't natural. And honestly, it's just bewildering to me that neither Tom nor Gemma were immediately uh, concerned the moment they stepped into yonder. The, the lack of um, life and variety. So when they finally arrive to the show house, as it were, the creepy real estate agent who looks like Alfalfa from The Little Rascals or uh, like Crispin Glover from Charlie's Angels um, brings them inside and I think the inside of the house is actually weirder looking in some regard than the neighborhood itself. Everything is way too neat and perfect and there's no artwork or anything and it, it's actually kind of reminiscent of how a show house would really be in real life. So Martin takes them through the house and takes them upstairs to the nursery which is very, very strange. The implication that they must have a child or that he's encouraging them to do so. It's very odd. And then we get this incredibly strange moment. Do you have children? No, and not yet. No, not yet. Like, what the hell was that? <laughs> and then he just leaves, vanishes in a supernatural sort of way where it's like impossible that he could have just disappeared so quickly and the way that he does this will be revealed later in the film so as soon as they realize he's gone they're like sweet we can get out of here now so they hop in their car and they drive down the road back to the entrance and there's no entrance and they just keep driving until they end up back at the show house number nine i have to say this movie has a very black mirror vibe to it. It's also very similar to The Twilight Zone. Those are like the two uh, other pieces of pop culture media that I can directly compare this film to. So they spend the rest of the day driving in circles trying to figure out how to get out until their car runs out of gas. And for me as a viewer, this is a very disturbing moment. It's very claustrophobic, even though they're in a very open area, seemingly. And although it's never directly explained in the film how this works, 
It is somewhat revealed by the director in an interview that I'll talk about later in the video. But in my opinion, I think the reset point is about a block. So every time they drive about a block away from the house, they'll end up back at the house. And there's several moments in the film where they'll be outside shouting and they can actually hear themselves shouting about a block away. It's not an echo. They're literally hearing themselves a block away as if they're in some kind of multi-dimensional space. So by this point, they're obviously starving. So they go back inside the show house where they find a bowl of strawberries. And upon eating them, Tom very quietly remarks that there's no taste. So not too long ago, I got pretty sick and I completely lost my sense of taste entirely. And let me just tell you that losing your ability to taste food is terrible. And I'm not trying to make it seem like food is that big of a deal to me or anything, but I'm here to tell you that your sense of taste is incredibly important. And when you lose it completely, like I did, it makes life miserable. It almost takes all meaning out of living. I know that sounds dramatic, but your ability to taste and enjoy food is such a primal, instinctual level thing. And to lose it kind of makes you lose your humanity a little bit. So not long after a mystery box is delivered to the house that they're now trapped in, containing supplies for them to live off of, mostly food. And when you see the food, it all looks incredibly artificial and pre-packaged and like it has no nutrients. It's all like vacuum sealed. It's like individually packaged shrimp and liquid egg and it looks disgusting. It looks worse than what you'd eat at your uh, elementary school cafeteria. But it doesn't just stop with the food. In addition to not being able to taste anything, both Tom and Gemma quickly realize that there's no wind, there's no breeze, there's no smells, and everything just feels off. And you start to realize as the viewer how important these things are that we take for granted and how miserable existence would be without them. So after exhausting every effort to try to escape their prison, they resort to climbing up on the roof and putting an SOS. They change it to say F you as they realize that the only person actually watching them are the people that trapped them there. And it becomes clear that in addition to the food being fake and the neighborhood being fake, even the sky is fake, the sun is fake, all the clouds are fake. So a few weeks later, another package is delivered to their house. But this time, instead of containing food, it contains a human baby, or at least that's what they thought. And on the side of the box, it says, raise the child and be released. Now, the word released is being used a little loosely here. That can have a lot of different meanings. After only a few months, the baby boy um, grows up to like the age of like 10 years old. And you can actually see in the movie, there's a, a scene where they show like his growth chart on the wall and it's only a, a couple months. And one of the very first scenes where you see the boy at this age, he goes into their bedroom and they're both just like laying in bed, flipping him off, which is, is such a weird moment. And the boy speaks with this very strangely deep voice, almost like an adult, where they've edited the child's voice to sound this way. And it's incredibly disturbing and off-putting and very eerie. Am I bigger today? Yes, you're bigger today. I grow fast as a dog. That's right. What is your dog? We already told you what a dog is. Woof, woof, woof! So every time the boy is hungry, he screeches at the top of his lungs in this ungodly alien screech, and it is absolutely ear piercing. Whoever the kid was that they got to play this character, he's perfect. I absolutely hate him. So in addition to screeching 24-7, he also constantly observes both Gemma and Tom, and I mean constantly, at all times, which obviously drives them completely insane. <laughs> Gemma comments that uh, the boy is a boy, and Tom very strangely says, That's not a boy. It's such an odd line. It's so creepy for some reason just to hear him say that. You realize that this entire time he's realized this is not a human being. 
it's something else. It's some kind of alien creature. So it leaves you as the viewer wondering, if this isn't a human being, what is it? And it's that uncertainty that creates a lot of tension and a lot of fear. You're left wondering, is this thing capable of killing? Because it certainly looks like he could. So in a moment of desperation, after realizing that there's no way out, forward or back, left or right, Tom decides that maybe digging a hole might be the way out. So he becomes obsessed with this project of constantly digging a hole in the front yard all day, every day, because he's got no purpose. He's just like an animal being fed every day. He doesn't have a job anymore. So he does this for a couple of reasons. One, he's trying to find a way out. And two, it gives him meaning. It gives him some reason for being there. Stop! Gemma, please, just let me dig, okay? This is something that I can do. Please just let me do this. So the boy becomes obsessed with watching a television program of some sort on the TV every night, and it's some kind of crazy alien static. It's clear that it's teaching him something. It's training him, it's explaining something to him in some kind of coded language, and it sounds horrifying. The noises that it emits are terrifying to hear. And on top of the screaming and the constantly observing them, uh, he also very strangely mimics them all the time, like a, like a parrot constantly mocking them and copying everything they say at the worst times as if he's trying to antagonize them further and make their lives and their existence even more miserable and unbearable and i have to say if every moment that he does this is i find hilarious it's so awkward and weird i'm to blame how is this my fault tom i'm sorry jam it's just this place is making me crazy the food here makes me feel sick So one day the boy disappears and he returns with a book. Now, by this point, both Tom and Gemma, they've explored every explorable area of this uh, block that they have access to. They've seen everything in it. They know everything that's there. So to see a foreign object like that would immediately set off alarm bells. It's very clear that he must have gotten this from the outside, which would imply that he has the ability to leave. So while Gemma is alone with the boy, she tries to trick him into revealing the information of where he went and who he spoke to and how he got this book. And it's at this point that the boy reveals to Gemma that he's not human and he stretches out his neck and these growths appear on his neck, much like a bird. And he screeches in an even more alien way than before which is a very, very creepy moment. Gemma looks into the book and sees a clearly alien language and uh, images depicting the anatomy of whatever this creature is. So the movie skips forward in time a little bit to the boy now being fully grown. Now he's a fully grown man and uh, he's arguably even creepier than before. So Tom is still digging the hole at this point. He finally gets to the bottom and he finds uh, two human corpses. That's when it sort of occurs to him that these are the people that were brought here before them. So after climbing out of the hole, it's revealed that he's incredibly sick from lack of nutrients and from inhaling all of that fake dirt. And he dies right there on the street side. The fully grown boy then appears with another box, but this time containing a body bag, which he zips Tom up in and then drops him into the hole. At this point, in a rage, Gemma tries to attack the boy, and then he lifts the curb on the street up like freaking Play-Doh and climbs inside. And Gemma is just able to follow him into this alternate reality dimension portal. And inside this alternate dimension, which she's clearly not supposed to be in, she sees multiple other couples experiencing the same fate. After running through this labyrinth of different dimensions and seeing all of these different couples going through the same experience, she's shoved out of this reality. And then later she succumbs to the same fate as Tom and dies. The boy then zips her up as well in a body bag and drops her in the hole. He then hops in their car, leaves yonder to go back to the real estate office where he finds Martin from the beginning of the movie, who's now very old and decrepit, who dies right there on the spot. The boy then folds him up in a potty bag in a very strange way and puts him away and then takes on the role of Martin so that he can repeat the cycle all over again.
One of the big reasons why I chose to talk about this movie, out of all the other strange movies I could have talked about, is because of a phenomenon that has fascinated and piqued my curiosity for years. And it was this prior knowledge going into Vivarium that I believe captured my attention more than most who saw the movie and were sort of left scratching their heads. It's a phenomenon known as brood parasitism, and you'll probably be surprised to learn that this phenomenon has actually had a larger impact on popular works of fiction than you might have realized. So let's circle back to that incredibly strange shot at the beginning of the film and discuss the relationship between the warbler bird and the baby cuckoo who murdered the other hatchlings. Merriam-Webster defines brood parasitism as social parasitism among birds characterized by a bird of one species laying its eggs in the nest of a bird of another species and giving no paternal care to the eggs. The cuckoo bird drops one of its eggs into the nest of a warbler bird, which looks identical to the warbler's actual eggs. The cuckoo egg hatches a few weeks before the warbler eggs, so that it can be fed without sharing. Once it's large enough and has enough strength, it hoists the warbler eggs out of the nest, sometimes occurring after the warblers have hatched as so gruesomely depicted in this film. From then on, the cuckoo hatchling is constantly fed by the unsuspecting warbler mother until it's fully grown, resulting in some of the strangest imagery I've ever seen in a film. The cuckoo then migrates for the winter and then returns to repeat the process, a never-ending process that ensures the survival of the cuckoo species. Out of all the different natural phenomenon to speak of, I've always found parasitism to be the most fascinating as well as the most disturbing. And apparently so have many storytellers in the recent past, from filmmakers to video game developers. I remember several years ago playing Resident Evil 4, arguably one of the best video games of all time, and about midway through the game coming across the journal of a character named Luis Serra a scientist who is investigating the cult Los Inuminados and their connection to an ancient parasitic organism known as Las Plagas. His notes read as follows. There are some parasites that have the ability to control their hosts. It's basic knowledge among biologists, but not much is known as to how the parasites do it. Here is a list of some of the parasites that have the ability to manipulate the behavioral patterns of their host. Dicrocelium. Once the larvae of this parasite migrates to the ant's esophagus, it alters the behavior of the ant. When the temperature drops in the evening, the infected ant climbs to the top of a plant and clamps onto a leaf using its mandible. It stays there immobile until the next morning, placing the ant where it's most vulnerable to be eaten by a browsing herbivore such as a sheep. One could conclude that the parasite is manipulating the host's behavior to its way into the body of its definitive host. Leucochloridium. This parasite's spirocysts develop in the snail's tentacles. The spirocysts are vivid in color and pulsate continually, somewhat like a worm. Surprisingly, the infected snail makes its way to the top of a plant where it is most visible to the eyes of birds, therefore more likely to be eaten. Once eaten by a bird, the parasite will complete its metamorphosis into an adult. In his notes, Louis explains that these parasites work much in the same way as Las Plagas, the central antagonist of Resident Evil 4. Another popular video game that caught my attention when it was released back in 2013 was The Last of Us, which many of you probably already know is a post-apocalyptic survival horror game where the main characters are trying to survive a zombie apocalypse caused by a virus of sorts known as the Cordyceps Brain Infection or CBI, a parasitical fungal infection. Mmm, that sounds good. According to TheLastOfUsFandom.com, the fungus grows while the host is still alive. With hosts undergoing four stages of infection, stage one begins with two days of infection, wherein the host loses their higher brain function, and with it, their humanity, rendering them hyper-aggressive and incapable of reason or rational thought. Within two weeks, the host enters stage two of the infection, where the fungus begins altering their sight as a result of progressing fungal growth over the head and corruption of the visual cortex. After a year of infection, the infection enters stage three, scarring their face and blinding them, resulting in them developing a primitive form of echolocation to compensate. In very rare cases, if the host survives over a decade, they reach stage 4. They develop hardened fungal plates over most of their body. When the fungus kills the host, the host's body grows stalk-like fungal projections which release infectious spores. So it's very obvious to me that CBI is directly based on Ophiocordyceps unilateralis, the zombie ant fungus. When the fungus infects a carpenter ant, it grows through the insect's body, draining it of nutrients and hijacking its mind. Over the course of a week, it compels the ant to leave the safety of its nest and ascend a nearby plant stem. This theory is further confirmed to me as the fungus in The Last of Us is spread by attaching itself to crops exactly like the zombie ant fungus in real life. So you might begin to understand why this is such a brilliant basis for the plot of any horror story, because it's something that actually occurs in the real world. And it's often crossed my mind, if this sort of thing can happen in the insect world, literal zombies, is it really much of a stretch that it could possibly cross over into the human world? Especially considering Resident Evil situation? where many of these viruses are just natural organisms that were mutated in a lab? Is it really much of a stretch that humans and their arrogance might one day be responsible for introducing these horrors into our world? So circling back to the plot of Vivarium, the real estate agent at the beginning of the film, Martin, acts as a fully grown cuckoo bird who is now tasked with continuing the reproductive cycle of his species 
and leads the unsuspecting human couple into his trap. Once trapped, the human couple, Tom and Gemma, are forced to raise the boy as if it's their own. And the analogy goes deeper than just the reproductive cycle. These creatures are quite literally bird-like. This is why the boy stretches out his neck and screeches like a bird. Notice how he screeches every time he wants to be fed. This is exactly what the baby cuckoo bird does to force the two warbler parents to feed him constantly. According to the director of Vivarium, Lorcan Finnegan, quote, They have this kind of magpie rattle. I guess there's an avian influence on the whole film. Once we started talking about cuckoos, sharing things with other birds, and magpies are certainly annoying black and white birds, they make a horrible kind of rattling noise, and especially when there's a bunch of them around. It's quite aggressive and irritating, so that's how they communicate with each other. Their throat sounds, and they make this kind of magpies rattling sound. And there are more of them. Yeah, I mean, there are thousands of them. Another noteworthy detail is the speed at which the boy grows. The cuckoo hatchling only takes two weeks to become fully grown, as it's constantly screeching at the host warblers for food. At the time that the boy is fully grown and no longer has any use for the host parents, they're both killed and done away with. Although this is somewhat different than in the case of the cuckoo bird, I believe this is meant to be symbolic of the warbler hatchlings who are killed in the process. And just as the fully grown cuckoo bird returns to the nest to repeat its life cycle, the boy returns to the real estate office to take on the role of Martin. Another natural phenomenon that appears in Vivarium that flies somewhat under the radar is the concept of mimicry, a tactic used by several different species of animals and insects to either evade predation or to prey on other living creatures. And just like parasitism, mimicry has also had some influence on pop culture. The first example that comes to mind is the film Mimic, which came out in 1997 and was directed by Guillermo del Toro. In the film, a mutated and gigantic breed of hybrid insects use mimicry to prey on humans. I bring this up because it's seen several times throughout Vivarium. The first noteworthy example is that very unnerving exchange between Gemma and Martin near the start of the film. No, and not yet. No, not yet. And then all throughout the rest of the film as they're raising the boy. The boy is constantly parroting them, much to the irritation of Tom and Gemma, as it comes off as simple mockery, like this alien creature is taunting them. As if on top of the cruelty of imprisoning them and forcing them to raise an alien child, they're even willing to make fun of them and their situation. However, this isn't the case at all, and it ties into the reproductive cycle of this species. It's literally the reason why the parasites force humans to raise their young, because in doing so, the parasite child is able to learn exactly how humans act so that he can copy them and use mimicry to trick the next generation of humans into falling for their trap. And when you see the boy mocking them, he's quite literally practicing how to be human, simply out of instinct. So by understanding both mimicry and the nature of the cuckoo bird, you'll understand all of the boy's strange behaviors. The mockery and the screeching. The cuckoo bird uses mimicry by adapting to lay eggs that look identical to the warbler's eggs. Additionally, a mother cuckoo has adapted to have plumage similar to a hawk, making attack from the mother warbler less likely when sneaking an egg into her nest. The creatures in Vivarium use mimicry by looking and acting almost exactly like humans. If all this seems like circular reasoning to you, the strange humanoid species tricking humans into raising their young, just to repeat the cycle over and over again, I'm here to tell you that it absolutely is. And if you have a problem with that, take it up with nature. This literally happens in nature all the time. So what exactly is a vivarium? And how is the word significant to the plot of the film? It's actually pretty simple and will instantly sort of answer some of your questions you might have after finishing the film. It's a fish tank, or like a terrarium. A glass cage one might use to house a pet, whether it be a fish or a lizard or anything similar. And usually we attempt to make these artificial environments as close to the animal's natural habitat as possible. But we never really quite perfectly capture the environment. It's basically impossible. Deep down, your pet fish or lizard knows that something's off. As convincing as yonder might seem at a glance, both Tom and Gemma know deep down that this isn't home, as much as Martin and the boy might try to reassure them that it is. Tom notes that the food has no taste. Gemma comments that the clouds are all cloud-shaped. And moments before Tom's death, he asks Gemma if she remembers wind. Even the sun is fake and provides them no nutrients. And it was likely the artificial soil that killed Tom as he's constantly inhaling it while digging the hole. Yonder is basically Sea Haven Island from The Truman Show on a multi-dimensional level. And in the film, the neighborhood known as Yonder acts as the bird's nest. But in this scenario, it's more of a trapdoor blister universe used to imprison unsuspecting human couples. Now I have no idea if anyone else made this connection or if it exists purely within my imagination. But from the moment I first saw the boy in this film, I was instantly reminded of a very old episode of The Twilight Zone from 1961 
called It's a Good Life. In fact, this is actually my favorite episode of the show. In the episode, a six-year-old boy named Anthony has godlike powers which include mind reading and the ability to basically bend space-time at the slightest whim. He's basically got multi-dimensional abilities and transports his town Peaksville, Ohio, and isolates it from the rest of the universe, literally imprisoning an entire town and enslaving all of them. Throughout the episode, all of the adults are forced to do everything for Anthony. And if they even so much as think negative thoughts about him, he instantly mutates them into monsters and then buries them in a cornfield. And you mustn't think bad thoughts about me either, or I'll do the same thing to you. The creatures in Vivarium trap human couples in an alternate reality prison where they must do everything a creepy little boy tells them to do until he eventually kills them. And by the way, the boy as well as his entire species have multidimensional abilities, as confirmed by the director of Vivarium. In an interview with Collider.com, Finnegan remarks regarding the creatures, quote, Time can be warped, so they can manipulate time and dimensions, similar to string theory, essentially. The different realities are vibrating on slightly different frequencies, but they're all stacked up together. That's why they can create this place that you can get lost in and kind of go around in a loop. In fact, in the same interview, he even explains the significance of the number on their front door, that a number nine is basically a straight line that turns into a loop, illustrating exactly how Tom and Gemma found themselves trapped in this alternate reality. I remember thinking to myself after the first time I watched Vivarium, maybe these aren't aliens at all. If the analogy of the cuckoo bird is meant to be the basis of the film, wouldn't it make more sense that this species has existed alongside humans since the dawn of time? Well, this was actually confirmed by the director. Kind of. He doesn't directly state this as a fact, but he does suggest pretty heavily that this is the case. That they've always existed with us, using mimicry to hide in the shadows. Making them even more terrifying in my opinion. This isn't an alien invasion to take over the world like pod people or something. This is just an earthborn species trying to survive. According to Finnegan, quote, to me it's like they have a symbiotic relationship with people, just like a cuckoo does with a reed warbler for example. And they've been living in parallel with us as far back as history goes. Perhaps even they were like a hominid at some point and split off. But I've read stuff about aliens and all of that as well. I mean, it really depends on your definition of what an alien is. As in, not all aliens have to come from spaceships and from space or whatever. If the cuckoo bird is just another type of bird, just like the warbler, what if these creatures are just a different type of human being? And this suggests another deeper implication. If these creatures prey upon humans, but humans don't prey upon them, doesn't that imply that they're actually higher up on the food chain? If we put fish in a fish tank, and these creatures do the same thing to us, wouldn't that mean that they are our natural predator? So is there any deeper meaning or allegory of note to Vivarium, outside of the whole parasite thing? I mentioned at the start of the video that I suspected there might be some sort of commentary or statement being made about the state of modern consumerist society, and I can confirm from the director that this is the case. However, there are a few other details discussed by Finnegan that can be summed up pretty quickly in this interview with Collider. We start thinking about the itemization of society, the separation of community from the natural world, and the loss of actual community altogether, and people feeling isolated and sort of trapped in these social contracts, and actual contracts with banks. So there were all these kinds of things that we were touching on slightly in the short film that we wanted to expand upon in a more philosophical sense and through sci-fi rather than supernatural. Around the same time, this is like very early on, we were just sort of spitballing ideas and were thinking, what if one of these kinds of housing developments went on forever, like it was a quantum trap? And then we were also thinking, what is it that young people are afraid of these days, on a more existential level? Are they afraid of big, weird, winged creatures? Or are they afraid of their lives becoming repetitive and boring, and all their hopes and dreams getting sucked away by making a couple of wrong choices? So we were trying to create a monster that would be relevant for that story. So pretty much what I take from what Finnegan is saying here is that rather than making a horror film about ghosts and goblins and scary monsters, he wanted to make a horror film using something that young adults are truly afraid of. Commitment. <laughs>